Almighty Father in heaven, in the name of your Son, our glorious and victorious Savior, Jesus Christ, we humbly ask for your blessing upon our worship of you on this, your holy and sanctified Sabbath day, so that we may grow more in our knowledge of you, our love for you, and our obedience to you. I am the true vine, and my Father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered. And men gather them, and cast them into the fire, and they are burnt. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. Amen. Today is sermon number 699 overall, sermon 259. 
in our ongoing complete reading of the Holy Bible with King James translation. Uh, I do record these now uh, about a week ahead. It was asked yesterday, considering all the things going on in the world. Uh, maybe one of these days uh, there won't be a world to listen to it, or some major thing will happen. And I, I re realize that that is a possibility, but I, I found that by uh, doing, the, I think the last, before our break, during that month, we had two power power outages don't happen very much here. But they happen twice in, I think, three weeks. Power outages just happened to happen when we were going to do our recording. And it was just added to the stress of, of everything else as well, on um, technically and everything. And I, I just, that's one reason, primarily primary reason, the first reason, but it's also I've found that I can do, um, particularly with r the written studies, um, better work simply by when you're not being rushed. When something is done, something is done. It isn't a matter of, well, the clock says it's done, so we have to stop it where we are. Uh, I'm able to put more time, more work into it. And so for that reason, uh, that's the way it's done. I've found actually... Um, for the reasoning that we're we're using these, they're not just a weekly Sabbath sermon. They're also something that is there for reference at a future time, trying to make them timeless, just as the Bible is itself timeless. That applies just as much. I mean, considering that most, a very good chunk, most of the prophecies by the prophets haven't happened yet, at least in their fulfillments. And, you know, about a third, some people estimate, about a third of the Bible is prophecy. A lot of the Bible hasn't happened yet. So it's timeless in the sense that, you know, the future is pretty modern, isn't it? If it hasn't, if it hasn't even happened yet. And so in that sense, we're looking to the future. We're speaking of something, not only the prophecies in themselves, but the lessons that they provide. Because, again, prophecy and history directly connected. A lot of people can't handle that yet. They live in their little Alice in Wonderland uh, worlds in which uh, the delusions that they have are their reality. Or I think I mentioned this uh, a sermon or two ago, or if I didn't, I should have, how people will filter their Christianity through their nationalism. And whatever doesn't go through the filter, well, they don't care. They just throw that part out. And what's all left is the church of this, the first church of the nation, revering their own nation, statehood. I mean, that's, and that's understandable. I mean, that's where the church of Rome came from. It was the whole point of it. It's the church of the Roman emperor is really beginning with Constantine and all of that. So even that is, is old, but it's new. But it's not something that I want to get boxed into or even I, I one thing I would have changed about daily Bible study actually is that the studies were dated and they were dated for because that's the way that it began but I wouldn't have dated them I would have numbered them and because people will will find the study online of of some say, about Matthew 24 and they'll see a date on it that it was written five years ago so they think wow well, it's old it doesn't you know, it's irrelevant now. But the Bible isn't. You know, so I think it's state of the world. I, I started numbering those. I, I got that lesson. But to go back now and renumber, remove all the dates and put numbers in them, I don't do that. Uh, they, they do have a number in the sense that the URL is the date. Uh, for example, today's study will have today's date on it with the year, the month, date, day number of the month. So they're numbered in that sense, but I would not have, have done that. Because people will look at, at a date, as I said, like 10 years ago or something, and they won't even bother reading it. Some people won't. But it's got nothing to do with the date of the publications. It has to do with the timelessness of the Bible itself. And that, and that in itself is a very good lesson. And what, what, is, what is old isn't. People don't get become different. That's a shock to a lot of people. I used to think of old people. They get old, and that's that's the way all old people were. My grandparents, for example, they were they were old. They all lived to be quite old. And I assumed, well, that's that's what old people are. That's what they're like. When you get old, you're gonna be like them. But then I realized later on that 
were they were old, yes, but they were simply the people we'd always been. And we're you know we're seeing people now from the fifties and and forties and fifties. They're getting to be old, but they're still acting the same. You see somebody eighty years old older on their Harley, and their long hair and their beard and their you know all the stuff. They haven't changed anything. And again, uh, it, it doesn't. You don't become somebody else when you get old. You just get old. That's the way it is. A neighbor of mine, I think I mentioned him in a sermon. Uh, he retired. Uh, he was a factory worker at Massey Ferguson in Brantford, uh, where they made Massey Ferguson combines. I think the company went bankrupt, but he was he retired before that was a problem. And he was like I think 55 or 60 because he was there for he was, he was the only job he really had. He started as a teenager, so he retired fairly young. And he had a big family, a number of children. I don't think his retiring early had anything to do with it because he had the children before that. But I remember he used to, he was my neighbor. I could actually, he's about three houses down. And he used to walk around the block every day as his exercise. Rain or shine, year round, doesn't matter if it was hot or snowing or blizzard in the winter or whatever, he would be out there, pouring rain. He'd walk around the block. And some people say, well, walk around the block was. I mean, for some people, that might be a big thing. But out in the country, a block is like a mile on every side. And in this particular one, some blocks are bigger because, and this particular one is because there's the creek that runs through there. So they extended it. They couldn't put the road where the creek was. So they went down actually about another half as much. So it's like a mile and a half, and then a mile, and a mile and a half, and a mile. That's his walk around the block. And he did it for like 40 years. He was out there. You know, he would, I could always see him. He always had this walking stick because every, about every third or fourth house is a dog that takes a run at you. But he was out there walking, walking, walking. And he died this, this past August. Um, and you'd think, well, you know, he made it to 90. But, you know, the kind of death that he had was, you know, whether he's, his heart, was healthy and all that. Probably it was. I mean, you can't do that kind of walking like that. But he was never sick. And I'm just thinking, well, you know, he really had it easy in the sense in, in how he died in that he wasn't never sick. He was he was almost 90 years old. He's still out there with his walk. He never stopped that. But he went to Woodstock just, try, I assume, for his stuff and groceries or whatever errands. And just he was never sick. He went to Woodstock to get his stuff, and he just dropped dead. I guess a massive heart attack, and they're, they're saying he was dead before he hit the ground. I'm not, I'm not laughing. I'm, I'm happy that, you know, it's too bad all people couldn't die like that. 90 years old, and just simply be suddenly so overcome by by the sleep. You know, you're, you're dead before you hit the ground, and never having been sick. You know, that's that's pretty good, I think. And maybe his walking, you know, got him to that. Got him to 90 and, and helped him along for a while that. But, you know, it, it's something that is timeless in the sense that he was who he always was. I, 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 there were many times I'd drive by and sit and talk to him. And I've, talk, I've done it for 40 years. He never changed. I mean, once you become an adult, 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 he never really changed. And he has a huge family. Uh, many children, I think he was 18 grandchildren, many great grandchildren. So he's like a really old guy, but he was, he was like the guy he was always 30, 40 years old. That's, that's who he was, even though he was almost 90. And the Bible, you know, it's the same thing. It, it, it does not become something else simply because it's been around a while. And, you know, the Bible's been around a long time, but it's timeless and it's yet future. And for that reason, uh, I wouldn't have dated. I dated the the studies. Uh, still do as, as I do with the sermons as well. Sometimes you have to because the holy days. But even then, there's the controversy. Well, you should be using uh, the Hebrew calendar dates, which I do for the sermons. Um, and I think I used to do with the studies, but it was just too confusing for most people. And those who cared already had their calendar anyway. But it's something the Bible is not. It doesn't matter when something is written or recorded. Truth is truth is truth is truth. It doesn't matter what it is. And what we're doing, recording, uh, and all that is intended to be there for the long term. As long as the world's there, 
such as it is, and then later on it won't be necessary anymore because the Messiah is coming and there will be a very different kind of teaching. You won't need the, the internet anymore or any kind of electronic means. It will be a spiritual means of communication. And that's good too. And that as well at that time will still be the... It's sort of a paradox. It will be on earth. And there will still be the sun and the moon, the calendar and everything. But we, if we make it, we'll be timeless in, in the sense that we won't age. We won't get any younger. We won't get any older. We'll just be what we are. And I'll put the link on as well about what the father looks like because I think that's going to be a surprise as well. He's, he, he doesn't look old because he isn't old. He simply is. Beginning today then, John chapter 15, as we read part of in our opening prayer, let's finish it now or look at the context of why he said something. Because a lot of people will read this and say, well, I'm a Christian, they say, so I can just ask for whatever I want and the Lord is going to give it to me. And then when they ask for something silly or non-Christian or unchristian, and they don't get it, then they get mad or embarrassed or something. But if you look at the conditions, the terms and conditions, if you will, of the promise, that is to say, Obey the commandments. Make righteous decisions. Make righteous choices. Make righteous requests. And then you will get the Lord's favor. And even if he then doesn't still do something, maybe there's a greater reason. Or maybe he sees something that you don't. Because sometimes, you know, you can have a car that goes really fast, but is that a good thing? Or if something prevents you from going in a particular direction, maybe there's a reason for it. It's the reason we had parents in due time when we were younger, and helpers ever since. Because we can't see everything. And we're warned, if you will, if you use that word, that in many counselors there is greater security than someone who simply thinks they know it all. Because the know it all doesn't. No one knows it all. The counselors don't either, but when you have many of them, you will have at least a willingness, an opening to begin with, if the person is willing to have counselors, that they have an opportunity to hear. They don't have to do it. They can still make the final decision. But in doing something, very few people know how to do brain surgery or know how to do uh, car repair. It used to be really easy, but now with all the electronics, you need specialized equipment, um, which most people either can't afford or would find cost ineffective to buy just for the amount that would use it. You have to be a, an auto technician to make it worthwhile. So that's it now. That's the way that is. And so you go to a specialist, and they can tell you. If you don't like what they say, well, go to another one. You can do all sorts of things, but you have to be told, and you have to do something for a good reason, very good reason. And again, read it, but let's read it again in the full context. I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. I'll put the link on for husbandman, what that means. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. So what does that mean? You're going to be claimed to be a Christian. Everything's going to be just ducky from then on. Or you're going to get squeezed once in a while. To squeeze out some of the stuff that shouldn't be in there. Because that's what it's saying, to be purged of something. Verse 3 now, you're clean enough through the word which I have spoken unto you. There you go. You can't ignore the word. That would make you ignorant. Because ignorant has got nothing to do with intelligence. It simply means to ignore something that someone has been told. There are a lot of highly intelligent but profoundly ignorant people because they choose to ignore what they know. Clean what's in this book. Verse 4, abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit 
of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered, and men gather them, and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. And again, man, speaking of the species, the word there, autumn, means humans as a species, male and female. They were created, put the link on for that, autumn. Actually, Adam, I think I mentioned this a number of times, Adam, we don't really know his name. They were all Adam. The male gave his wife, the female, a name. The Lord didn't. He did. But we don't know. It's just the man. It's like the dog or the table or the chair. We don't know what names there were. The names came later. I'm sure he must have had one. I'm sure he probably had a name or two for him. But that's the way it was. Autumn is what the name comes from. They were both autumn. Verse 7, if you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. So there you go. You have to obey the righteousness, the word of God, before our request will even be listened to, let alone favorably answered. Why? Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. So is the Lord going to grant you something or anyone? I don't mean you specifically. Something that is going to be shameful to the Father because it's the Holy Spirit, which is not a person. It's the power of God. That's the one thing um, I find really... That I saw on Facebook a while back uh, a Christian uh, discussion group in which Right up front, there is a warning, if you don't believe in the Trinity, you will be not allowed in, or if you sneak in, we will hunt you down, we will hunt you up. As though, why are they so, you know, something strange there. I believe in the Holy Spirit, I believe in the Father, I believe in the Son, but I don't believe in the Trinity, because that's not what the Bible says, not what the Word of God says. Verse 9, as the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide and abide in his love. So a lot of people say they love Jesus, but they don't keep his commandments. So they are either knowingly or unknowingly, in most cases I think, not loving him. Because to him, love means to obey. Verse 11, These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. This is my commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Ye are my friends, if ye do, whatsoever I command you. Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth, but I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard of my Father I have made known unto you. So from that point on they could become ignorant. And then, you know, the paradox of that, they were being told, but then the possibility of, of ignorance happens because they could choose to ignore it. And ignorance means to ignore. You can't be ignorant of what you don't know. It's actually a paradox in that in its fault because a lot of people say, well, he, they're ignorant, meaning they don't know. But that's not literally correct as a matter of what the word means. Ignorant people are people who do know, but choose to ignore it. I know I emphasize that particular point, but that's, I think, one of the greatest problems of why people don't really do what the Lord says. 
because they even read. They'll walk around with a Bible and reading it and quoting it, but they don't do what it says. They ignore it. Whereas someone who's never read it, never heard it, well, they can't be ignoring it, can they? Verse 16, Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you, and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. And again, see the reason there? The purpose for it? Even then, it's not a personal sort of thing. I mean, people could ask, well, I want to live forever, I want to live to be 190, um, but that's contrary to the gospel of the coming kingdom of God. It's contrary to salvation. It's contrary to eternal life. So would that be a good thing? If someone asked to live forever physically, and you know, people who, who, if that were ever to be possible, I think it would be far more of a curse than anything else. Really. I think there was a Twilight Zone episode about that one time. This man made a deal with the devil supposedly, and he became physically immortal, not that could kill him, and he became so bored that he just couldn't handle it anymore, and he was in a, a an argument with his wife, and he accidentally pushed her, or she tripped or fell, they lived in an apartment building, and she fell off, and he was convicted of murder for that, and he was sentenced to life in prison, but life to him was forever. I suppose maybe they would catch on, but this was the twilight zone. And there was an out clause. The devil gave him an out clause that you can choose to die if you want to, but then you get to go to hell because he had sold his soul to the devil. And that was the twilight zone's version of that. Some good points in it, though, but way off in the Bible. Verse 17, these things I command you, that you love one another. If the world hate you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. Now stop. Think about that. If you really preach what the Word of God says, you're going to get the same hate and rejection that he did. That's the warning. And that's a fact. Whereas if you preach something that the world loves, well, they're going to love you. Absolutely love you. Though many people, their supposed Christianity must pass through a filter of some sort, whether it be Usually it's a nationalistic filter. And whatever makes it through is, is their Christianity. But if something doesn't fit, it can be many other things as well. But usually it's a nationalistic filter. Well, you're losing stuff then, aren't you? You're losing a lot of pieces, aren't you? If you don't take it all. All of it. Verse 19, If you were of the world... The world would love his own. But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Remember the word that I have said unto you, The servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. But all these things will they do unto you for my name's sake, because they know not him that sent me. And again, much of uh, it shows well there again the, the innocence of people yet, because they don't really understand the gospel. That does take the Holy Spirit. They aren't really ignoring something that they don't fully understand. They ignore it to the point where they can quote a verse, uh, where they can call Sunday the Sabbath, Oh, that's that's a real. I I really have to start grinding my teeth on here that one because it's it's just mm, so absolutely wrong and actually blasphemous. You know the Roman pagan Babylon Sunday. They're calling it the most holy day of the week. Not quite true. Way off true. But there are some who did know. For example, the old worldwide Church of God's generation that that destroyed it. They did know. They were brought up with it. You know, they attended Sabbath services. They understood the teachings. They knew why. And I, I they really, I, I wouldn't want to be in their shoes. I'm not going to be their judge. The Lord is, of course, his judge, everyone's judge. But they don't have the, the excuse. They can't say, I didn't know. 
Billions of people right now could say, I don't know, or I didn't know. They're not ignorant. But those who did know, again, they, they're ignorant. They're really ignorant. And they went out actually just not only ignoring it, they destroyed it, everything. That, as I understand, uh, they actually had a, a book burning in the back area of the Pasadena uh, property. I, I don't even think they own that anymore, do they? They bulldozed it all and sold it, sold it off for uh, condominiums or something. It was in a very expensive area. Somebody made a lot of money there from those sales. But they actually had a book and tape burning of all the old material from the Armstrong years and, and all the other writers or any other writers as well. They sort of cleaned the place out and burned it. And as I understand as well, there have been copyright actual court fights where they wanted to prevent um, people from republishing work by Herbert Armstrong because technically it was still under um, the publisher rather than the writer. Actually, a daily Bible study is actually like that as well. Um, technically, Keyway Publishing owns it, owns the copyrights to everything I've written and recorded. So, but I own Keyway Publishing, so it's no problem yet. Might be someday, though, but if I hadn't done anything about it. Verse 22, if I had not come and spoken unto them, and they had now just consider here what ignorance means. Verse 22. If I had not come and spoken unto them, they had not sinned. But now they have no cloak for their sin. He that hateth me, hateth my father also. And again, you see the ignorance? It's exactly what we're talking about here. If I had not come and spoken unto them, they had not sinned. See, they didn't know. But but now they have no cloak for their sin, because he did tell them. Now they're ignorant. Ignorance is a is a big problem. It can get you into a lot of trouble. Because he's talking about ignorance here. And again I emphasize it's got nothing to do with intelligence. Or simply not knowing. Because the ignorant do know. Seems like a paradox, doesn't it? But there it is. Verse 24, if I had not done among them the works which none other man did, they had not had sin. But now have they both seen and hated both me and my father. And again, this, that might be a hint there why John the Baptist is at least not recorded as having done any miracles. And apparently he didn't even though he was the, the Elijah to come. How oh, that name is used generically almost. I'm only gone for that. But you see the reason. But this coming to pass, that the word might be fulfilled, that is written in their law, they hated me without a cause. But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceedeth from from the Father, he testify of me. And again, the whom and the he, they are from Greek language, structure, feminine, and masculine pronouns. It does not mean he or she gender physically. It's not the same. And again, plainly stated, it come out from the Father. It emanates from the Father. It does not come out beside the Father. If it was another person, it couldn't very well come out from the Father, could it? Verse 27, And ye also shall bear witness, because ye have been with me from the beginning. And again, they could surely be ignorant, because they were there all that time. Judas Iscariot, the traitor, chose to be ignorant. He chose to ignore everything that he saw. And you just think about that. I mean, the miracles, all the things that we are not recorded. I mean, he was with them for years. The things that he must have saw. He saw the miracles with his own two eyes. Everything. The teachings. The, how the Lord could actually, you could actually sit as he did and listen to the, the, his voice, the expressions on his face, his hand gestures, the things that he did. Everything that we 
we don't have. And yet, what good did it do when he made himself ignorant? We are far ahead of him if, if we don't choose to do the same as he did. Because look where ignorance got him. He chose to ignore everything he saw, and he became a traitor. With the condemnation from the Lord's own words also, it would have been better if he hadn't been born. That's where ignorance will get you. And that isn't just simple not knowing, which is innocence. Ignorance is guilt. Defiant, rebellious, evil guilt. John chapter 16, and again, notice carefully how one reading reading of a particular chapter is not the whole story in itself. Many people, uh, in order to understand a verse or to study a verse, will read the whole chapter, and that's good, but sometimes the chapter isn't the beginning, because notice, these things have I spoken unto you that you should not be offended. It's not that this is the beginning. Verse 1 of chapter 16, what's he talking about? And you wouldn't know, of course, unless you read the chapters, chapter, chapters, before it. They shall put you out of the synagogues, yea, the time cometh, that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God's service. Now think about that. Is that the atheists? Are the atheists interested in doing God a service? No. Religious people. Well, does that mean... Uh, the boogeyman uh, Muslims are up to get us. Well, no, not really. For most, in most cases, they don't really think much of Christianity, unless it sort of gets in their way. What they're talking about here, and as we know from the Messiah's own crucifixion, it was the people who claimed to be the followers of the Lord who rejected him and hated him and killed him. It wasn't about the Jews. It had become Judaism, and that's a very important distinction because Jesus was a Jew. You want to get somebody offended, just say, say that. But it, it was not a matter of, of race or nationality. It was something the people who claimed to be the very people of God were the ones who hated God's word the most and actually killed people. All the, the people, the persecutions, much of what was going on through the New Testament era, the Romans were really, they weren't much involved in Christianity at this point. It was a matter of the people of the Lord, who claimed to be people of the Lord, who were doing all the persecuting. The Romans, they were the empire, but they were not really all that religious. Yet. They had the religion, that's true, but it wasn't Christianity. It wasn't a matter of forcing their Sunday Christian religion. They had their Sunday too, though, but it was not a matter of what came after that time. And the idea that Peter was the first pope, absolutely ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. Peter would be extremely upset, or is going to be, I think, if, and I think emotion is still going to be there. It's the same as Mary, to understand, when she sees what has been done to her memory, the idolatry, the Mariolatry, She's going to be absolutely horrified, just I'm sure, is Peter, uh, to be called what he's called, you know, the, the father of the Antichrist Church. I mean, that's what. But a lot of things need to be fixed in this world. They're going to be. Verse 3 And these things will they do unto you, because they have not known the Father, nor me. But these things have I told you, that when the time shall come, you may remember that I told you of them. And these things I said not unto you at the beginning, because I was with you. But now I go my way to him that sent me, and none of you asketh me, Whither goest thou? And it's an important point there. You'll notice there the distinction, the teaching. They still didn't understand. You know, they were expecting the Messiah to be what the people of Judah, Judah, to this very day, they're looking for another King David who's going to rule the world from Zion. That's what they're looking. They're not looking up, and neither were Peter and all the rest of them at that time. When Peter drew the sword that night, he was not thinking of a heavenly Messiah. He was thinking of a, of a king, another King David. And to him, that's what it meant. Verse six. But because I have said these things unto you, sorrow hath filled your heart. 
Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And again, the hymn there is not a hymn as in a, a male person of a trinity. It is a Greek language structure. Uh, French is very much the same. Uh, feminine and masculine pronouns, nouns, have a he or a she applied to it when in fact they're in it. And the Holy Spirit is in it. But he was actually warning them here. You know, Peter got all mixed up when, when the Messiah told him to put, put away the sword. Uh, we're not going to do that. And Peter, he was he there, you know, he stepped in front of the mob and said, let's go. And he didn't just say it. He drew his sword and he started to chopping, swinging into chopping. And the Messiah stopped him. And he was already warned of that here. He was warning him of it. You know, it's not going to be unless I go away. And he was talk, talking about his death. And he, he reminded them of that, warned them of that. And he actually rebuked Peter at one time, uh, saying, no, Lord, it's never going to happen to you. But to Peter it meant the assassination of a king, even though that's really what it was. It was the assassination of a king, but not a king at that time. And as explained to Pilate later on, you know, he asked, are you a king? He said, you know, I am, but not of this world. And, you know, Pilate, he, it rattled Pilate. It rattled him pretty good. And not only that the, the Messiah was, was cool and calm, because most people in that position would be bawling and pleading for their lives, whereas the Messiah just stood there and looked at him, wouldn't even bother talking to him, to defend himself, let alone answer it. Same thing with Herod. And, you know, it just, he didn't, he broke the rules in the right way, because he wasn't playing according to their rules. And they're going to know in due time, uh, and I think a lot of them did realize, they did. Even the people who, who, who killed him, you know, the, the centurion standing at the cross, he became a convert. He saw it. When the Messiah died, uh, the, the, it wasn't an eclipse, it was the sun became dark. And eclipses don't happen as long as it's recorded in the Bible. They happen for a few minutes. It wasn't that at all. The earthquake, all the things, the resurrection temp to f physical temporary life of, of dead people, uh, see them walking through the city, you know, it gets your attention. And a lot of them became believers. And actually, those, the Romans, they didn't have to convert from what a, a, the pagan idea of Christianity because it didn't exist yet, as I said. They, would, they had to be converted. I don't think most of them really were all that religious anyway. But if they did, it wasn't Christianity. They didn't have the Protestant Christian or Catholic Christian, both of which are, are Roman. They're, you're no closer really with either one. I've compared it many times to two competing gas stations across the street, fiercely competitive, but they're owned by the same guy. That's the fix, how the fix is in, in the world right now. They think, you know, you, the Protestant Reformation, all that, they think, well, you know, we're free of Rome and all that. But you still got Rome's doctrines. So different. Verse 9 of sin, because they believe not on me, of righteousness, because I go to my Father, and ye see me no more. Of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. Howbeit when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you in all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall bear, that shall he speak, and he will shew you things to come. That's speaking of the Father. The spirit of the Father. It's plainly spoken. The Word of God, all the things that were described up with the links on for those studies. It's a long story, but a short one, if you're willing to believe what the Word of God actually says. Paradox included. Verse 14, He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall shew it unto you. All things that the Father hath are mine. Therefore said I, that he shall take of mine, and shall shew it unto you. A little while and you shall not see me, and again a little while you shall see me, because I go to the Father. Then said some of his disciples among themselves, What is this that he saith unto us? A little while and you shall not see me, and again a little while and you shall see me, because I go unto the Father. And I have two things. In a little while he was going to be crucified, and they wouldn't see him again. 
but from their conscious perspective, because many of them were about to be killed, or they would be in the coming decade or two, from them, a little while would be such that the resurrection would happen. They don't, there is no sense of the passage of time. They're all dead, but from their conscious perspective, the resurrection would have been as quick as a blink. Instead of many times people who, who die, they're worried about their funeral arrangements and everything. But from your conscious perspective, you will be alive at the instant of your death before they do anything with your physical body, which you don't need anyway. Your physical body is constantly being broken down and rebuilt all the time. You know, the old saying, you are what you eat. You know, go without food or water for a while and you die because it's not being re replenished. And, you know, the recycling of, of elements that go throughout the earth, we, we have been many people as far as our physical. I'm not talking about something like reincarnation or anything, but just the physical elements, the recycling of, of metal or of all sorts of things. It's a very direct analogy. It's how nature is, is how, how it works. Verse 18, They said, therefore, what is this that he saith? A little while. We cannot tell what he saith. Now Jesus knew that they were desirous to ask him, and said unto them, Do ye inquire among yourselves? Of that I said, A little while and you shall not see me, and again a little while, and you shall see me. Verily, verily, I say unto you, that ye shall weep and lament, but the world shall rejoice, and ye shall be sorrowful, but your sorrow shall be turned into joy. A woman, when she is in travail, hath sorrow, because her hour is come, but as soon as she is delivered of the child, she remembereth no more the anguish, for joy is that a man is born into the world. And then there are the speaking of the species, male and female. But thank like God for that. Eve was as much Adam, autumn, a human, as the male was. We don't even know his name. The Lord called him the man, or the human. That's what the Lord called him. We don't know what Eve called him. We probably wouldn't want to know after a while. Out there in the woods and the cold and all the rest of it, I've been kicked out of the garden. Although he could probably uh, give her a response to that as well, because well, whatever. The blame game started at that point. That's what I'm referring to, because when they were caught, uh, the man pointed the finger at the woman. The woman pointed the finger at the serpent, and you know, on, on we go. Verse 22, and ye now therefore have sorrow, but I will see you again, and your heart shall rejoice, and your joy no man taketh from you. And in that day ye shall ask me nothing, verily, verily, I say unto you, whatsoever ye shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. And that's not return, referring to, can I have a million dollars to take a trip around the world, or can, I, can we win the game next Friday, or, you know, silly things. Verse 24, Hitherto have ye asked nothing in my name. Ask, and you shall receive, that your joy may be full. These things have I spoken unto you in Proverbs, but the time cometh when I shall no more speak unto you in Proverbs, but I shall show you plainly of the Father. At that day you shall ask in my name, and I shall, and I say not unto you, that I will pray the Father for you. For the Father himself loveth you, because you have loved me and have believed that I came out from God. I come forth from the Father, and I am come into the world, and again I leave the world and go to the Father. His disciples said unto him, Lo, now speakest thou plainly, and speakest no proverb. Now are we sure that thou knowest all things, and needest not that any man should ask thee, by this we believe that thou camest forth from God. Jesus answered them, Do ye now believe? Behold, the hour cometh, yea, is now come, that ye shall be scattered, every man to his own, and shall leave me alone. And yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. And that was referring to what happened at the crucifixion. They all ran 
uh, actually some at the arrest. Uh, Peter uh, tagged along but ended up denying him, knowing, saying he didn't know the man, but he, he was talking, he was just very confused at the time. John later on uh, witnessed the crucifixion at the foot of the cross, but he did so standing beside his mother and his aunt Mary. Jesus and John, the Apostle John, were cousins, as were, in fact, Jesus and, and John the Baptist, both of them. I, I think it was another line between John um, the Baptist and the Apostle John, other than uh, from from the Messiah. He was more related to the two of them than they were to each other, put it that way. You can figure that out with many families. Verse 33, These things have I... I have spoken unto you that in me you might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And again, all people will look at that. And you know, all the nice platitudes and things Jesus is saying, supposedly. But they're really, if you want to take the smile off somebody's face, just, and you don't want to, but I'm saying rhetorically, Teach what the or teach what the Messiah actually said, and watch what happens. If you if you apply it to what he actually said, rather than sugarcoating it to the point it's it's not recognizable anymore, and it's not for the most for the most part for most people. I mean, Catholics read the Bible, but they don't believe it. I've heard of Catholics. Some I went to a Catholic school for four years. We never read the Bible. Never. We had mass every Friday. But we never read the Bible. I actually, I think I mentioned one time, I went to the library, the school library, just to see if they had one. And I found two of them, two Bibles in the library, but they were like brand new. You could tell they were never read or even opened. They were like brand new. I don't know how long they'd been there, but there was those two and that was it. I don't even know why they had two. They, don't, they wouldn't have done much more with two than just one. But you've got to do what it says, not just have it put it on your coffee table or put it on your bookshelf for people to see or carry it into your church on a Sunday morning. Read a verse here and there and, and never really do anything because it's your life. It's your guidebook to eternal life. John 17 These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Father, the hour has come. Glorify thy Son, that thy Son also may glorify thee. As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. Notice how he speaks of himself in the third person there. Can you imagine why? Is there a role there? It's like some politicians will will, will speak say, the, the Prime Minister or the President, when speaking of themselves. It's a, a term because they recognize there's a role that they are fulfilling. And the Messiah, as an ordinary human being, then realizing and knowing full well what he was, uh, as the Lord God, you know, he, he made very plain he's going to return to what he was before. Imagine that. I mean, there he was in his as low as could possibly be, even lower than the angels, just a mere physical human, and all that that entails, and realizing that he's going to return to what he was as the Lord God, the very one who was sent to do the work of creation. But he's, he speaks of himself there in the third person because he realizes as a man, you know, he could have been anybody. You know, people thought John the Baptist was, was the Messiah. He could have been. You know, if not for facts, there would have been a, had to have been a John the Baptist for John the Baptist. But he could have been because Jesus was like his brothers in every way. I mean, that, that's plainly stated. There was nothing about his appearance that was any different. Uh, he was the most righteous man, but that was made possible by the Holy Spirit of the God, of, of the Father of God. And it was not something that, you know, he, he could have been anybody. But he was, imagine one day when the day came. I don't think he knew it as, as a newborn baby. He wouldn't have known it as a toddler. But as time went on, he would have realized he was special. Certainly he realized it by the time he was 12. 
at a very interesting age there as well. But he knew it when he was age 12. But, you know, even then, there's only so much that can be comprehended in a 12-year-old mind. You know, there, there's the old joke, most people don't get past 12 years old in this world. And there's, I think, a lot of truth in that, really a lot. I mean, think back when you were in school, the schoolyard full of 12-year-olds. Just think back. And all that you knew. I mean, they weren't just dumb little children, were we? You know, they knew a lot, a lot of things. And, of course, nowadays it's, you know, infinitely more. But those those minds, those attitudes, those people simply grew up and became the adults that they once looked up to. And in generation after generation it goes. A lot of the attitudes really never changed. And most people, of course, have to live their lives, whether it be a career or for good or for bad, uh, based upon decisions made by somebody 12 or 13 or 14 years old. I mean, people do change their career paths and things, but for the most part, you know, the first part of your life is determined by the decision of a 12-year-old. I mean, wow, think about that. But it's the same with everybody. But the Messiah was different, but he, again, it's very interesting how he speaks, spoke of himself in the third person that way. It's not just a gram grammatical matter of translation. He was doing it. Verse 3, And this is life eternal, that they may know, that they might know, Thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom Thou hast sent. And again, to, to Jesus, you know, Christ was not his name. Christ meant Messiah, meant, meant anointed one. Jesus was the anointed one. Verse 4, I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. And wow. I mean, think about that. There's a mere human standing there. And the, at the very beginning, let us make man. Um, let there be light, all the things that were done and, and as a matter of the creation and plainly stated throughout the scriptures, it doesn't require any interpretation. It was the Messiah, the one who was born as Jesus Christ, who was the Lord God who did all that work. And he was the one that created his Sabbath on the seventh day. After his rest, after his work, he rested. He made, it was, you know, it doesn't get much more Christian than being created by Christ as a fulfillment of his very purpose of being sent as the Lord God to do the work of creation. I mean, it just goes right to that very heart of the reality of that. And the Christian professing world absolutely detests that reality. Absolutely. And I, I still don't understand that. I remember I, before my conversion, I never, I was religious, but, you know, normal, regular but I never had any strong feelings toward people who weren't or anything. I just didn't really much care. I mean, I I didn't have anything against religious people, but I didn't have anything for them either. It was just like, well, that's the way they are. But if you try to live according to what the Word of God actually says and, and say something about it, well, then suddenly uh, the people who claim to be Christian, again, as we read, uh, they're not good much going to like it. They're going to be offended by it. And I don't understand why. What What is your right to think what you want and live your life? What has that got to do with them anyway? Because we know as true Christians you can't force. That's another major difference. You can't force the truth on anybody. Only the Holy Spirit makes the understanding and the awareness and the willingness possible. Whereas the churches of this world, they think they can pass laws and and do all sorts of things that force their religion down everybody else's throat. And it just doesn't work. Verse 6, I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest me them, me, and they have kept thy word. And again, men, the autumn is there. And keep in mind, there were a lot of women followers. Uh, it was a woman who announced the the resurrection of the Messiah it was a woman who was the first to discover, to speak with the Messiah as he was risen. I'm referring to Miriam. 
from Mary Magdala. There were many of Martha and Mary up in Bethany. Uh, it was near their home that the, the ascension actually took place. Um, all the things that he knew, there were many women that followed along. But again, the custom of the time, it doesn't matter. I mean, it wasn't a feminist thing or, or anything of the sort. It makes no difference. We, we read that there's, they're all the same. It doesn't matter of Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female. And again, I'll put the link on that study. There was no difference as a matter of autumn. Autumn meant male and female. And it's, it's specifically stated that way. He created man as an atom or autumn, male and female, female. He created them. Autumn, period. And it was not, again, the, the male he called the man. And he could have referred to Eve just as much, the man. He was pointing out there, and if she was the only one standing there, he could say the man, or the human. Over there. You know that? Human. But it was, it was Adam, or the male, that gave her, the female, her name. The Lord didn't do that. Male did. We don't know what she called him. That's it. Verse 7, Now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee. For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. And again, the reason why he's called the word of God. He spoke the word of God. The Bible is the written word of God. All the things that were said is the Lord God. And again, that's something else people have some problems with, big, big problems with. For now, I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. And all mine are thine, and mine are thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. The King James English is a little cumbersome sometimes. And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to thee. Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are one. That's referring to the church of God. The people of God. Church means people. It doesn't mean a building, a corporation, all that. None of that. Verse 12, While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me I have kept, and none of them is lost but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. And now I come, and now come I to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I. I am not of the world. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but thou shouldest keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy work, truth. Thy word is truth. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself, that they also may be sanctified through the truth. And sanctified, from which we get the word saint, merely means set apart. If you have something that you use only for a specific purpose, you are sanctifying it. Verse 20, Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also, which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And the glory which thou gavest me I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them, and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. Notice there no mention of the Holy Spirit, because it was the Spirit, the power of God, that is 
referred to there. It's, the, it's how they communicated it. It was the power of God that was used as the creative force. Thank God for that. The entire series of studies done for the Holy Spirit about the Holy Spirit. Father, I will that thou also, whom thou hast given me, be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. And again, that goes right back to the very beginning, referring to the statements made in Genesis. O righteous Father, the world hath not known thee, but I have known thee, and these have known that thou hast sent me. And I have declared unto them thy name, and will declare it, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them, and I in them. Thank you for joining us for services this week. As always, your being with us makes our joy complete. Until next week, when we meet again on this, God's holy Sabbath day, may the Lord bless thee, 